I don't know why you love me I'm so glad you touched me And I thank you for saving my life One more time, please Whenever I wonder You would not leave me Oh, you never, never left my side Lord, I don't know why you love me But I'm so glad that you touched me And I thank you for saving my life. You've been so faithful, so faithful. You've been so faithful. With each new morning, there is brand new mercy.
Aren't you glad this morning that we have the promise from the Lord that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will go with us even until the ends of the earth. Oh, hallelujah. Open your Bibles to the great book of Exodus, chapter 17. We're going to finish a message that I preached the first half a month ago. And so this will be part two, one month removed. We will touch, though, on some of the points that I made up so everything will flow correctly, but I want to get to the main topic that I was not able to cover when I began. We'll begin reading Exodus chapter 17, verse number 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, I want you to stop for a moment. I want to make a statement real quick here. This speaks, and what I'll read to you through the rest of the text, is a encounter, a battle that would take place between Israel and the Amalekites. It portrays in the physical, though, a great spiritual lesson of the inward struggle of sanctification in the life of the believer. What would be carried out as Amalek attacked Israel? That means of victory that God brought to Israel in that battle is the same way that we win the victory today, which is dependence upon the Lord. Justification is God fighting for us. Sanctification is the Holy Spirit fighting in us, fighting that Adamic nature to make us into the image of God's Son. But it is He, and only He, that can bring about that transformation. We cannot sanctify ourselves. If you try to sanctify yourself through your works, your life will be nothing but a daily battle with Amalek. But thank God, thank God, thank God, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. It's not what I do, but it's in my faith in what Jesus did at Calvary 2,000 years ago. I'm not a slave to Amalek, but I'm a bond slave to Jesus Christ. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim and Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he laid down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, look at me real quick. In the original translation, it says, write this for a memorial in the book. 
This is the first mention of the Word of God. It was not a printed Bible like this, but it was in scrolls and parchment, even carved on the staffs that the great prophets of God would lean upon, telling all the great stories of how God led them, brought them out, and won victories for them. We have today a complete book, a memorial of all of the good things that the Lord has done on our behalf. Somebody needs to shout. Everything you read in the Bible, it's for us. Hallelujah. For it, I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. That means the Lord our banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Once again, that inward struggle of Satan, even though we're saved, trying to work in us, to get us to depend upon the flesh, our works, our own ability. And that brings bondage and not victory. I want to minister, part two, write this for memorial in the book. Would you bow your heads? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for all the goodness and the kindness that you have bestowed on all of us. As I stand here this morning, I understand that I must depend upon the true teacher, the true preacher, the anointer, the Holy Spirit. I yield my life to the Holy Spirit that the Spirit of God would speak through me to these, your people, whether in the sanctuary or by Sun Life Broadcasting Network. Anoint me to minister and anoint these, your people, to receive. And Lord, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, if there is an inward struggle, a bondage in their life, may the word of God that I bring forth this morning become a rhema word in the life of every single person a word of revelation, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, amen and amen. Sanctification outside of justification is the most important doctrine in the word of God as it regards the believer. Sad to say we're living in a time in the church world that the term sanctification is so misapplied or, or misused if it's even used at all. It, it, it's almost like someone, and it's Satan, has tried to wipe that word from the vocabulary of the child of God. However, I want to remind you from Genesis to Revelation, there is more in the Bible concerning sanctification than there is justification. The very first book of the Bible to be written was probably the book of Job. And if you study the book of Job, you will find that it is not a book or a story of the redemption of man. But it is a story of the sanctification of the saint. The Bible said that Job was a perfect and upright man. That doesn't mean he was spotless. It means that he was doing everything that he knew to do in that time to live for God and to worship God. He was doing his best. But even in that, we find in the first two chapters that Satan spends a lot of time in heaven. And the Bible tells us in Job that at times Satan and the Lord will have conversations about one of his children on this planet. How cool to know that maybe... The Lord Jesus, our Savior, looks to Satan and said, Have you considered my servant John down there in Baton Rouge? Or my servant Sally? It's one thing if President Trump would call your name out in a positive way and a speech. Hey, man, that's great. But it's something else. All together, when God himself well, highlight and spotlight. And it said that he came said, have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect, upright, walks before me. The devil said, no, he only serves you because you've blessed him. 
And the Lord said, all right, I'll let you come against him. You can take his money. You can take his children. You can take everything he has, but you can't take his life. Satan said, all right, I'll do it. And when I do, he'll curse you and he'll not serve you, meaning that Job only serves you because of what you give him. Let me tell you something. Serving the Lord, there's so much blessing. I was thinking about it this morning. Everything that's connected with the Lord is blessing. But if he never answers another prayer that I pray, the day that I got saved, that was enough. That is enough. That is still the greatest day and the greatest blessing to know that no matter what happens, that my soul is secure in the hands of God. And I'm not going to go through all the story, but the whole purpose or the theme of Job was to bring Job to a place that he would say, oh, wretched man that I am. That he would bring him to a place that he would stand up in the midst of trial and tribulation and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Hallelujah. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. He's trying to make us over. Bring us to a place that our dependence is based solely on the Lord Jesus Christ and we're not depending on our talents and our abilities. I'm so thankful that it's not up to our talents and abilities because I'd be, I'd be out of luck. I mean, I can't sing. I can't play a piano. I know you remember in April, right before I had my surgery, you know, I, I told everybody, I'm going to sing this morning. Remember that? And I went over to the piano set by Brian, and, and uh, after the service, Mark came up to me and said, hey, we need to make, we ought to make a DVD out of that. And I went, I said, well, I don't know about, I said, I was flat the whole way. He goes, I'm going I'm to try to work on it. When I got back, I had to leave for a trip. He came up and he told Daddy, he said, I have tried everything I can. <laughs> I've done every trick that can be come up with. But I can't get him on pitch. And I, David told me, I started laughing. I said, there are some things that are bad that cannot be made good. And it used to burn me up. When we were traveling on the road, preaching and revival, and these little grandmothers would come up to me, and they would go, hey, you go sing like your daddy? You got to play the piano like your daddy? And I'm just, I'm smiling. I'm going, shut up. <laughs> shut up. I'm not a writer. Dad has 20 books right now waiting in line to be printed that he's already written. He's constantly. I can't, it takes me four days to get one sentence on paper. Now, I can say it out loud. I can preach it, but I have a hard time putting the brain with the hand and putting it down. I'm just not, Gable's a great writer. He's a wonderful writer. Lord, why did you skip me? <laughs> There's a lot of things I cannot do. But it doesn't matter. There's one thing I can do. And that is put my faith, my hope, and my trust in Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Oh, yeah, my voice is terrible. I can't write. I can't do this, and I can't do that. But a whole hallelujah, the Lord looked down and said, Boy, I'm going to put you behind a pulpit, and I'm going to call you to preach, and I'm going to give you an anointing, and you're going to preach my gospel all over the world. That's better than a hundred thousand gold records. That's better than a hundred New York Times bestsellers. Woo! To have the privilege to walk up and say, would you open your Bible tonight? Oh, my Lord! 
What a joy! What a privilege! I was preaching a few years ago in senior moment, <laughs> Virginia, under a tent. Did it? I was up. This church in the area, they had a for years they had a tent revival, ten day tent revival, and it was good. I hate tents. I hate tents with a passion. I hear these people say, oh, I wish we could go back to the good old days. Ah! Uh-uh. I want a soft chair. I want air conditioning when it's hot and a heater when it's cold. There's nothing fun about preaching under a tent. It starts pouring down rain. They have to close the sides and it becomes a sauna. And there's bugs flying around. And you're in mid-sentence, literally, telling the truth. It flies in your mouth. And before you can do anything, it's right here. What do you do? You swallow and keep going. And I was preaching, and, and uh, after the service that night, a young man came up and said, Can I just speak to you for a moment? I said, Sure, come on, come on. And he pulled me off to the side. He said, uh, I drove over from, I think he said North Carolina, to be in the service tonight. I just wanted to tell you what the ministry has meant to my life. He said, I was bound by drugs, bound by alcohol. He said, I just wasn't a, a user. He said, I was an addict. I was a disappointment to my mom and dad who were born again, spirit filled. He said, I'd been in and out of rehab, in and out of jail. He said, I have a record that's so long. He said, I've done everything, broken into house just to try to get money for more drugs. He said, I was so addicted that I would come to my parents' home, letting them think I was there to see them, but the reality was I was looking for something to steal so I could sell it to get money, to buy more crack cocaine. They t- I just heard... Right now in America, there are more heroin addicts in America today than in the history of our country. The New York Times, I read it on the headline on the front page not long ago, said that America is in a heroin epidemic. They quoted one police officer in one school. He said, yeah, when school is over, we used to find you could find... A, a, a little bit of a joint on the f- ground, or you could find a piece of cellophane that you knew would contain ecstasy or whatever. He said, now we find needles in the junior high and the high school. The overdose deaths, do you realize that over nearly 70,000 Americans die every year because of an opioid overdose? And we're having an epidemic. And that's what it was. He was bound. He said, I went to rehab after rehab after rehab. And they would tell me, you're cured. And I would walk out and I would say, I can do it. But three days later, I'd be high. I couldn't stop. No one can stop without Jesus Christ. But anyway, he said, I came to visit I hadn't seen my mom and dad. He said, this time I was sincere. I didn't come to steal anything. I just, he said, I just had this premonition that I wasn't going to be here much longer. I knew the drugs and the alcohol were ravaging my body. He said, I walked in. It was Sunday morning. He said, my dad and my mother, their ritual for Sunday morning was the same. Eight o'clock, our program would come on. And they would sit down in the den and watch the telecast and get dressed and go to their church. Nobody was allowed to disturb them from 8 to 9 o'clock. He said, I walked in, and he said, I hated y'all. I was so sick of the name Jimmy Swagger. He said, then when you came up, I said, oh, my goodness, another one? And he said, I walked in, and... Dad, how are you doing? And my dad said, be quiet. Sit down. We're watching Brother Swaggart. He goes, I don't want to listen to Jimmy Swaggart. He said, not that one. 
the boy, Donnie. And he said, I'm sitting there. I didn't like you, didn't want to hear what you had to say, but you got to tell it a story of a young African-American in Honolulu, Hawaii, that climbed over the balcony of his penthouse apartment bound by cocaine and he had lost his job as a vice president in one of the largest businesses in Honolulu and he had lost his fiance, he had walked away. He was right on the verge of being evicted from that penthouse apartment in Waikiki because of his bondage to cocaine and he climbed over on that balcony and he was going to jump to his death as I was relating in the story. His name was Eddie Richards. And all of a sudden, he said, I had the TV on, Eddie told me this. He said, I was so discombobulated, I don't know if the program was on, and I just didn't know it or whatever. But he said, I'm standing on that ledge. I'd already climbed over, and I was trying to muster the courage to jump. And he said, all of a sudden, it was like somebody turned the volume up on the television a hundred times louder. And I heard the voice of Brother Swagger say, stop! Stop right now. You don't have to die. Jesus Christ died in your place. And he can break every bondage. And he said, I begin to shake all over. I climbed back over that railing, walked into that apartment, and I gave my heart to the Lord, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and became a preacher. And he said, you were telling, you told that story. And then you gave the altar call, and I'm sitting there. And for the first time in my life, I felt that pull. And in my heart, I said, Lord, if you can deliver an African-American man about ready to commit suicide in Honolulu, you can take this old alcoholic and drug addict in the hills of North Carolina, and you can save him and clean him up. And he said, that morning, I gave my heart to the Lord. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've not had a drink. I've not had a snort. I haven't had a fix. I have no desire. And I just came to say thank you. And I was trying to be dignified. I, Sir, Thank you so much for telling me that. I appreciate that so much. Get in the car to go back to the motel. I'm telling the truth. Walked over, put that key in the door, turned it, walked into that room. As soon as that door shut, I kid you not, I threw my briefcase across that room. I said, devil, did you hear that? Somebody got saved. Somebody got saved watching me preach. Oh, that's worth it all. That's worth it all. If that's the only person that would ever come to the Lord under my ministry, it's worth it all. Bless, bless. I got, Greg, I, I, I want to give this to you real quick because it, it sets the scene real quick. As I told you a month ago that beginning in Exodus 12, all the way up to the chapter that I read from that, the chapters paint a perfect picture of salvation. In Exodus 12, we find the story of the Passover, the offering up of the Paschal Lamb in Egypt. You know the story. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see, not your degree, not your education, not your money, not your status, not the fact that you're the mayor or the president or the governor or the richest man in town. But when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And it's just as real today. When I see the blood, when I see every one of you that say the blood has been applied to the doorpost of our heart. Oh, hallelujah. We have been brought out of Egypt. And when he brought us out, spiritually speaking, he's healed us spiritually. He's restored our youth and vitality. And he's paid us back for all the money we wasted in the world that the devil. Can you believe? Most people could solve their financial problems if they would just quit smoking and drinking and gambling. Then they wouldn't have to be on welfare. And that Passover lamb, thank God, 2,000 years ago, 
what was the type in Exodus 12 became a reality as the true Paschal Lamb stepped out of glory, was nailed to an old rugged cross, the crown of thorns upon his head, the hands, the spikes through the hands and the feet, the blood that poured out side pierced, and the scripture says the blood and the water mingled, mixed together, flowed out. It was horrible. It was gruesome. But in every drop of blood that was shed by our Lord, it was enough to atone for every sin ever committed for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. It paid the price. It is finished. Hallelujah. That's the reason why we are a blood preaching church. We are a blood teaching church. We are a blood singing church. We are a blood shouting church. Oh, can I preach for a moment? From a new, from the hymnal. Can I, pre- can I preach from here? There's no sermons in there. Yeah, there is. How, how you like this one? On Calvary's hill of sorrow, where sin's demands were paid and raise a hope for tomorrow across our path was laid. I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from Calvary. Its waves which reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. And I love this verse. And when gloom and sadness whisper, you've sinned, no use to pray. I look away to Jesus and he tells me to say, I see, I see, I see a crimson stream of (laughs) hallelujah that stream is still flowing that stream is still flowing that stream is still flowing I said that stream is still flowing one more one more one more one more would you be free from your burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you over evil a victory to win there's wonder working power in the blood. Oh, man. Somebody said, Who are you? You tell them, I'm a blood bought child of the Most High God, and I'm not backing up, I'm not bowing a knee. I don't care if my testimony offends you, get offended. I gotta hurry. But in Exodus 14, we see the, the crossing. Dad mentioned the Red Sea crossing, which pictures the entrance, our entrance, the believer's entrance into Christ and what the crucifix meant for. He saved us to bring us out of Egypt, to bring us into a promised land. Chapter 15 proclaims the great rejoicing of Israel once they had passed over. Well, they got over to the other side. Moses started singing. The Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider has he thrown into the sea. The Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider has he thrown into the sea. Then all of a sudden, Miriam, his sister, got all the women. Now, Nobody knows how many there were. There was either two million or three million. A lot of people. But there's always more women than men. If it wasn't for women, most churches wouldn't survive. Matter of fact, in third world countries, because of civil war and genocide, most of the Pentecostal churches would have evaporated and vanished because all the pastors have been killed and the deacons, but the women, the women would step up and say, you killed my husband, you killed my son, but I'm not going to stop talking about Jesus. And thank God has raised up women who are pastoring some of the biggest, Baptists, wake up, God can use anybody. And they started banging tambourines. Do we have a tambourine? Do Jason, you got a mess back here. You need to clean. Does that tambourine? No, it doesn't come up. Oh, 
There you are. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, Jason. Come on, come on. Thank you. Moses, the Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. Then all of a sudden, all the other sudden, all the women with tambourines. And they would repeat, the Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider has he thrown into the sea. We are victorious this morning. And then the same chapter, they get to Mara, the bitter waters of Mara, which speaks of the bitterness of life. They were thirsty. The Lord showed Moses a tree and said, cut down that tree and throw it in the water. In the moment that tree, a type of Calvary, touched the water. The bitter waters were made sweet. Oh, somebody needs to shout. Whatever is bitterness in your life, find the tree. Find the tree. Find the cross. Put the cross in the middle of your problem and your bitter waters will be made sweet. 16th chapter, the manna represents God's blessing to the believer, his provision. Manna meant in the Hebrew, what is it? It also proclaims to us the Sabbath rest, the Sabbath which represents the rest. And we're going to touch on that in a greater detail in just a moment. But now I'm going to get to my main text. Beginning in that 17th chapter, it said, that they were, the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were thirsty. No water to drink. The wilderness is a type of the bitter journey of life. Life is not fair. Life is cruel. Life, because of the fall, heartache, sickness, disease, Grief, sorrow, tears. You can't run from it. It's going to happen. You're going to have a time of a bitter journey. You're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And they were thirsty. That's why, listen to me. That's why Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be imploring the people, don't just sit there and watch and pass us by. There are men and women, boys and girls, who are in the wilderness right now, and they don't know what to do. And we've got the message. We've got the message. We've got the message. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. And the people begin to murmur. That's complete. Listen, listen, we all have some bad times, but don't whine about it. Don't complain. Don't murmur. That's a sin. Instead, stand up and say, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know the Lord is going to make a way for me. I'm so glad my dad my mother taught me not to be a whiner you don't want to start whining around mama boy shut up the Lord has been good to you and the Lord told Moses take your rod and smite that mountain it wasn't just a little rock it was a mountain and the moment he hit it he smote it it exploded and water came rushing out. The rock was a type of Christ. Paul said so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said that rock was Christ. The water that flowed out. That provided life. For those Israelites. And their livestock. Was a type of the Holy Spirit. That's the whole gospel right there. You get saved. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's God's will. You know it's a mate. Gabriel last son. The message you preach. I came in after my service, got in the motel room at 10 o'clock at night, still daylight in Ireland, Northern Ireland. And I was packing and I took out my iPad and turned on 
my SBN app and was watching the rerun of the morning service. Gabriel had already been preaching about 15 minutes. You won't believe this. I had to stop and sit down. We both preached on the same day, you in the morning, me that night, almost verbatim the same message. There was only one point that you brought out that I didn't. Even some of our statements were verbatim. I'm sitting there going, Lord, this is great. This is wonderful. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I don't have time. The rock was a type of Christ, the water type of the Holy Spirit. All right, then it says, then came Amalek. The Amalekites were descendants from Esau. You know the story of Esau and Jacob. The word of God would say, Jacob whom I have loved, Esau whom I have hated. Now that word hate there doesn't mean the hate the way we use it today. It really speaks of preference. What it really means is God who knows all knew the heart of Jacob and the heart of Esau. And he knew that in spite of Jacob's flaws, that he had a heart for God. And he would take him from Jacob and turn him into Israel. Jacob means schemer, fraud, deceiver, liar. Jacob, uh, Israel means prince with God. That's sanctification. When you study that life, sanctification. But Esau is a type of the flesh. The Apostle Paul, more than any writer, Old or New Testament, would use the word flesh. And when he spoke of that term flesh, it had a double meaning. It could, on the context, refer to the flesh that covers the body, but almost most of the time, almost all exclusively, when he would use the word flesh, he was speaking of our own efforts to live for God outside of faith and dependence in Jesus Christ. The book of Galatians is one of the most important books in the New Testament. It, had, it was about Gentile believers that Paul had preached the gospel. It says in the book of Galatians that he had preached Christ and him crucified so strong and made it so real to them that it was like they witnessed Calvary themselves, even though it was years after the fact. But when he left, the devil came in in the guise of the Judaizers, false apostles, false prophets, deception, came in and said, oh, yeah, Paul's a good guy. And yes, you must accept Jesus. Yeah, he's the Messiah. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But you've also got to keep the law of Moses, even to the point of all the adult males of Galatia that call themselves believers were to submit themselves to circumcision. Ouch! Law always hurts. Oh, I have something else I could say, but I'm not. And Paul would say, Oh, foolish Galatians. Now, that's the cleaned up version. In, in the actual text, it says, Oh, stupid Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you would so soon fall away from the grace given to the Lord? And then he would go on to say that if you put your faith in anything else as it regards your sanctification, your works, your labor, the law of Moses, or, or man-made law, the rules and regulations of a church, he said you are fallen from grace. I get so sick of hearing Christians or, and preachers say, well, if you sin, you've fallen from grace. No, you haven't. You fall from grace only when you quit believing. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? You're only fallen from grace when you refuse to repent and you turn your back and you walk away. If that wasn't the case, None of us would make it. But thank God for grace, grace, God's grace. Hallelujah. 
Oh, I don't have time. And some of you are going, what? what? Half the church, 90% of the church believes that if you fail the Lord, you got to go back and get saved all over again. No, you don't. My little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father who is the perpetuation of our sins and not our sins only, but the sins of the whole wide world. In other words, you say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I made a fool of myself. I'm not blaming my wife. I'm not blaming my kids. I'm not blaming the boss. I did it. Would you forgive me? And instantly that blood, that crimson stream, whoa, washes it all away. All right. The word flesh in the Greek has many meanings, but one of it is the frailties of the human nature. Or one could say it is the sin nature reigning in the life that renders the believer helpless. That's the reason why you've got, I, don't, I can't put a percentage, only God knows, but so many sitting in our churches that love God, but they're bound. There's bondages in their life. They've been told, you can fast it away. You can fast until they can pull you through a keyhole, and it won't sanctify you and bring you victory. You can memorize every scripture in the Bible and quote it until you got no hair left on your head, and it will not bring you victory. You can, take the, you can take communion every day. If you take communion every day, you'll never get sick. You'll always be blessed, and you'll always have victory. No, not in the Bible. No, no, no. And they don't know what the sin nature is. Half the church denies it exists. I like what Brother Lauren several years ago said. He said, listen, I can prove the sin nature. He said, all you got to do is put two two-year-olds in one playpen and one rubber ducky. And you'll see the sin nature rise up real quick. And it wasn't but a couple of weeks after he said that, I was watching TV. And I was watching a documentary on this filmmaker who had gone all over the world over a five or six year span filming little children as they grew. And I'm watching and there he's in the middle of the bush in some African country, in the middle of nowhere. And they're in a thatched hut. One African lady, her two children, they looked like they were twins. They were both about three years old. They were playing, each one of them, she gave each one of them a rock. That's all the toys they had. So baby number one got his rock. Baby number two got his rock. All of a sudden, baby number one. Baby number two. Baby number one. Then all of a sudden, baby number two leans over and bites a chunk out of his arm. And I'm sitting there going, sin nature, sin nature, sin nature. Okay, I got to hurry. The Amalekite, it was a physical battle, but it portrays a spiritual lesson. Okay, let me, I might have to skip some things. The principal characters in this are Moses, Joshua, Aaron, and Hur. The Bible said that Moses, who in this scenario is a type of the body of Christ, called upon Joshua, who was a type of Christ as a warrior, called him and said, you lead the men of Israel to war against the Amalekites. When the battle began, You know the story. Moses standing on a hill, and the hill was a type of Calvary. Had his hands lifted up. And as long as his hands were lifted up, Israel would win and prevail. But the Bible said that his hands begin to get heavy. There's a great spiritual lesson here. Your effort... No matter how consecrated you are, you can only hold your hands up so long. I tried it this morning. I walked into my office, put that clock on, and put my arms up and held them up for as long, and I couldn't go very long because I got 
an impingement in this shoulder. But if you could hold them up two hours, three hours, four hours, you cannot hold them up forever. You're going to get tired. And his tiredness would come upon Moses and his hands would start falling. And then the Amalekites would start to win the battle. So then Aaron and her, Aaron is a type of Christ is our great high priest. Her is a type of the Holy Spirit. His name means light. It's the Holy Spirit's job to illuminate truth. The first thing, Gabriel, bring me that chair right there. Real quick, singers, musicians, make your way back. Right there. We used to tell preachers, this, this square right here, they can take it up because there's stuff wired or whatever and we told a preacher one time that now if you're standing on there and you're not any good there's a button over there <laughs> and they'll push it and you'll be lost <laughs> he's getting weary have you ever gotten weary on this spiritual journey you've tried everything that you know to do but they brought and this is this is a blue chair isn't it pretty but it's not a chair. It's a rock. It's a stone. Just imagine it as a stone, okay? They brought the stone. They had to roll it. It wasn't a little bitty rock. It was big enough that he could sit on it. That rock was a type of Christ. What did the Word of God say? Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail but also that rock portrayed and gave us a type spiritually of the sabbath rest hallelujah. oh hallelujah the sabbath is not a day the sabbath is not a day but the sabbath is a person and his name is jesus christ he is our sabbath rest he's the one who said come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden and i will give you rest rest from what rest from the toil and the labor you don't have to go get a lamb you don't have to go to jerusalem you don't have to find a priest jesus christ is our great high priest and as the lamb he was offered up once and for all and now he's seated by the right hand of the father at rest ever making intercession and that doesn't mean he's turning around lord would you help donnie the very fact that he is seated and at rest means there's a continual flow of intercession for you and for somebody needs to shout and then Aaron and her. Uh, Gable, come here. You're Aaron. I mean, I need a Robert. Come here. Come on, quick. Aaron, her. Not H E R. H U R. Type of Christ, type of the Holy Spirit. Moses, a type of you, me, the body of Christ. We've grown weary. Our hands cannot stay up, which portrays dependence upon the Lord. We will look unto the hills from whence cometh our help. Our help comes from the Lord, not in our talent, our, our ability to overcome the bondages and the struggles of the flesh. And then Aaron and her, as Moses' hands would get tired, they would grab them and they would hold them up. It was no longer Moses doing it. But he had in tight Christ on one side. And the Holy Spirit on the other side. And he was at rest. He wasn't the one having to fight the battle. But our heavenly Joshua was the one that fought that battle and defeated the Amalekites once and for all. And now we are victorious. I've just come to say, you don't have to struggle with alcohol anymore. You don't have to struggle with pornography anymore. You don't have to struggle with lust. You can't sanctify yourself. But the same faith that justifies you is the same faith that sanctifies you. Uh, one last statement. 
Man, I hate getting old. You, you kids, enjoy your youth, because when you get past 50, it's all downhill. Rest. The Bible says his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Moses turned the battle over to the Lord. Then the Lord told Moses, write this for a memorial. Text it in a book, but I told you the original translation, in the book. And rehearse it. That means to read it. You don't just put it on your coffee table. You read it. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. There's no such thing as I close as sinless perfection. But if you understand sanctification is Christ or the Holy Spirit fighting in you against that sin nature to give you victory, to bring you into a walk with Him that is greater than anything you've ever experienced, it cannot be done by your efforts and labor. It's done by your faith. In what Jesus Christ did on Calvary and the Holy Spirit that now lives inside of us. I got five minutes, I'm gonna close. I was just as I said in Northern Ireland, that's a part of the UK. You can start playing very soft. We'll leave one little short little story. I love England. You that are watching from England, I love your country. Some of the greatest preachers in the world and missionaries came out of England. Well over a hundred years ago, William Gladstone was the Prime Minister of England. He's the only man in British history to be Prime Minister four different times. He was the founder of one of the major political parties that's still in Operation today, I forget which the name of it. He was a devout Christian, got saved as a little boy, even contemplated going into the ministry, but in college he fell in love with the law and became a lawyer. And he saw the law as a way to defend those that were being harshly or unjustly preyed upon by the rich. Or by the crown. Now he was wealthy. His parents were wealthy. He had the best of everything. He started every day by reading the Bible and then praying. As he would rise up to to be the prime minister, he did not look at it as a political office, but he, he looked at it as a way for him to bring good into the life of people. In other words, he saw it as a, an avenue to help the people. And he was very devout. He always would mention the Lord in his speeches in the Bible. But many years after his death, he was a prolific diary keeper. He kept a journal from the time that he was a little boy until he died stacks and stacks and stacks and he would record what happened that day it it was almost the writer of the book that I was reading Gladstone it's a book about that thick it said it was like reading a history book his diary but as he would relate the things that were going on in the world but he brought out in one of the chapters how personal it was as well that he brought out how that Gladstone devout, a lover of God, but yet there was a bondage in his life. And it said what it was, what is it? I'm not going to say, it doesn't matter. He wanted victory over that bondage, but he did not know how to get it. He went to pastor after pastor. They didn't know anything about sanctification. He would try through sheer willpower to not give in. And he would write in his journal, five days now and I haven't done. And he would name that bondage. I must have 
the victory now. I can live victorious. And I'm paraphrasing. But then the next day, I failed again. He got so burdened down with it. But he wanted victory so bad that as prime minister of England, then the most powerful country in the world, he would go into his bedroom, lock the door, strip the clothes from his body, everything, and take a whip and flagellate himself, beat himself, trying to beat out that bondage. And he would actually write in that journal, five lashes today. I think, if my memory serves me correct, the highest number they found that was 25, 25. He would beat himself with that whip until his back would bleed. And they begin to notice that there was a little symbol they would find on the page and they couldn't figure out what that symbol was, but it was almost on every page. And sometimes it would be one, two, three, four, five, or many. And they finally figured out, this is what, that it was a drawing, his drawing of a whip. And every time they saw that whip on a page, he was saying, I beat myself today, trying to gain the victory. He never did. We've got believers today trying to gain the victory through their own efforts when the victory has already been won. You can have victory over Amalek. Would you stand to your feet? Everyone standing. I, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anything like that because I, I'm just not. But as they begin to sing whatever they want to, if, if there's something there in your life that you need victory over, I want you to come and I want you to stand. And we're just going to pray with you for a moment. And then we're going to pray together for the share Monday and Tuesday. If there's a bondage there, you love the Lord, but there's a bondage that you need victory over, I want you to come on down right now as they begin to sing. Hallelujah. Come on, step out right now. Where could I go? Come on. Don't be ashamed. Come on. Give me some spirit-filled believers. Some of our folk here at the church, come stand with these. Come stand with them right now. Where could I go? Come on, give us some altar workers. Neighbors are kind. I love them. I want you to lift your hands right now. And And the first thing I want you to do is to repent for trying to gain the victory in your own labor, in your own efforts. And I want you to go back to the rest that is found in Christ, meaning you're saying, Lord, I can't do it, but you've already done it. And today I lay at the cross that bondage in my life. And that goes for those watching on SBN, those of you that are listening, wherever in the world that you may be, you don't have to walk as a slave one more day. Oh, hallelujah. Come on now, begin to praise Him. Oh, hallelujah. We can have rest. We can have rest. We don't have to be a slave to our passions. Let me close real quick. I'm going to pray for you. My prayers, though, can't set you free. My performance cannot set you free. It's your faith. Go back to Calvary. But Donnie, I have failed so many times. I don't care. I don't care if you have to go back a thousand times. 
The blood still cleanses and washes and grace is never turned off for that person who will come with a humble, contrite spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, these are your children that are standing here and those that are watching and listening by SBN. There's an Amalek in their life. There's a bondage in their life uh, that they've not yet gained the victory. I pray, Lord, that somehow, some way, in my fumbling efforts this morning, that they got a hold uh, of the truth uh, that we can have rest uh, from that bondage by putting our faith uh, and our hope uh, and our trust uh, in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Lord, let them be able to say, sin no longer has dominion over me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Father, we come before you as it regards the Sherathon. Let's lift our hands, all of you, all over this building. We come before you at this moment in time, this moment in history. We join our voices. We join our spirits together all over the world as a part of the body of Christ. We join our faith together as touching the share on Monday and Tuesday. I'm asking you that you would open up the heavens, that the Spirit of God would touch hearts and lives as it regards what you would have them to do. And Lord, as they are obedient to what you tell them to do, that you will rain blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon them. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said... Amen and amen. Be back tonight at 6 o'clock. We love you.